Um, tonight's presentation is actually in con um, sponsored in conjunction with the Cordova Volunteer Fire Department. And this is part of a tsunami readiness and emergency preparedness um, training that goes on over these couple of days. So tonight we are very pleased to have Cindy Preller from the <laughs> National Weather Service Alaska's division. She's a tsunami program coordinator and education and outreach manager. Um, her background in geology makes her very well prepared to speak about why and how uh, tsunami happen and to give us a training. And we also have Irvin Petty from the Alaska Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Um, he is a tsunami program manager from the National Tsunami Hazardous Mitigation Program. And his background in assisting communities with mitigation for disasters um, brings his, his uh, will bring that expertise to us this evening. So with that, I would like to introduce um, Irving first. Great. Thank you. <laughs> first thing I'd like to say is welcome back to Ms. Jody and Mr. Bob. They spent a fun time in Hawaii. I know that. <laughs> we were on different islands at the same time. Uh, well, welcome back, Joni. Joni is, to, uh, I tell this to everybody, Joni is the heartbeat of this city, makes things happen. Her and Mr. Groff, too. I can't leave him out. Uh, I've been working with Cordova years now. I've been here with Cindy before. She's been here several times without me. But you guys are always great in, in partnering and working with us in whatever program it is, whether it's the tsunami program, the mitigation program. Uh, we've been down here for floods in the past. And I had the pleasure of being here in January to come down and do some training for evacuation planning and tsunami work. And we decided that wasn't cool enough, so we were going to open up an incident command post and work with snow apocalypse. Anyway, we're really glad to be here. Cordova is one of our favorite cities, and you guys are great partners in all the emergency management stuff we do. So I've got a few slides here. The cool slides are Cindy's, the science guru. She always has the cool stuff. You're but we've cool. been we've totally been working cool. together a long time uh, with our tsunami program uh, <coughs> and it's been a great run we hope to keep it going uh, I will say before I start on these we had actually hoped to do a ceremony tonight a tsunami ready recognition ceremony but unfortunately the signs weren't able to get put up prep for winter you're so ready. close <laughs> you are so close you're you so will be close you're almost In fact, ready. Uh, we're gonna you're at the top of the list to be the next one, and you'll be number 11 for Alaska. Uh, we have a little race at side bet. We're, we're making it, and we won't go there. But you guys are the top of the list, and we'll be the next. Uh, so we were hoping to do that. We'll get the signs up, and shortly after that, hopefully you'll see our smiling faces here again with not 20, 30 feet of snow. But we'll be back to do a recognition ceremony to make you tsunami and storm ready. So I'm just going to go over some uh, quick stuff on preparedness as far as uh, in the home or what we do. Yesterday we spent most of the day, thanks to Joni, putting us in the school, talking to the kids. Uh, then we've got our tsunami workshops with a lot of uh, other communities. We invited them in here, and we're out at the Orca Lodge doing a tsunami operations workshop. And these are emergency managers, emergency responders, city leaders, and we're going through a whole emergency preparedness type of thing as to what they're going to do when they received the uh, tsunami warning. Who does not know that we had a tsunami warning Saturday night? Anybody? Cool. What did you guys do for it? Kept eating. Kept eating. <laughs> yeah, that's what you were supposed to do because you were not in the warning area. I'm glad to hear that. Some people say, oh my God, Alaska's in a tsunami warning, and people in Fairbanks call us and say, are we safe? <laughs> you guys knew what to do, and it worked great. Uh, of course. <laughs> Jeff. All right. So you guys are tsunami ready. We just don't have the signs. And I'm going to beat Paul up if we don't get those soon. Or Paul, Mo, I'm not sure who I'm going to, but we will get them up. So let's uh, cruise on through my slides. Uh, this is a partnership, and mainly 
I work with uh, Cindy out at the Tsunami Warning Center. She's actually assigned to the uh, regional headquarters weather, weather service, but she spends a lot of time out at Palmer. Before she went there, she spent a lot of time out in Palmer Saturday night, and she can tell you about that. It was a crazy night for all of us Saturday night. Uh, we closed our EOC down a lot sooner than they closed the warning center down because they still had uh, effects of this possible tsunami going to the west coast. Came, came towards us, kind of dinged us, little waves, but it kept going, so they had to wait and make sure everything was clear on the west coast before they could close up shop. And she had a late night omelet or something, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's a Fresh huge fries, partnership. <laughs> the state doesn't do it by herself. The weather service doesn't do it on their own. We've got a whole host of people here. Uh, our friends up in uh, Fairbanks at DNR with DGGS, uh, Geological and Geophysical Services, they do mapping for us. They actually do the final mapping product when we get uh, mapping and modeling done for what is the possible threat here. The folks that do that actually is the Geophysical Institute at Fairbanks. They'll take all the data, run the models, see what waves are going to come in here, how far it's going to go in, where's our inundation zone. We're all going to go up to the school and we're going to be safe there. Uh, of course, the West Coast Alaska Tsunami Warning Center, that's who gives us all of our information. We base everything that we pass out to the communities on their recommendations. This is a warning, it's an advisory or it's a watch. I didn't say that. <coughs> but uh, we work real close with them all the time. They're part of the Weather Service. Uh, FEMA's a partner with the state for any recovery actions that we might have to go through after a tsunami. Uh, and kind of our parent organization for all of us uh, is NOAA, but we have the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program. It's all the coastal states in the country, including the East Coast and the Gulf Coast, the West Coast, Hawaii, and all of our territories, Puerto Rico, USVI, Virgin Islands, and all of our Pacific territories. So it's uh, 26 states and then all the territories. Uh, we're funded through NOAA, and we're hoping that funding will continue in 13 with the election, everything coming up, we're not sure, but uh, right now we're on a continued resol resolution, and we hope that we're gonna continue to be funded. We've got senators on our side pushing to reenact the Tsunami Warning Act, and hopefully keep us funded. We're keeping our fingers crossed, right, Cindy? So there's and a lot of people that are involved in the National Tsunami Program. In Alaska, it's Weather Service and Emergency Management, our mapping friends, and our communities. We can't do it without you guys wanting to participate. And uh, we really thank the city leaders for participating. I've heard stories in Oregon where they put up uh, signs that you'll see here in a community. Some of the locals went out and they cut the signs down. These are the evacuation signs. And the question was, why did you cut them down? This looks bad. This is a tourist town. These tourists are going to come in and say, we're in a tsunami zone. I don't want to go there. I, my, my outlook as an emergency manager was, that's the town I want to go to because I know they're looking out for me. They're mapped. They know where the safe place is and how to get out of there. So our tsunami ready communities are really great. First thing we always tell everybody in any of our presentations, we're going to talk about tsunamis, but this message goes to the schools, it goes to the open forums, it goes to businesses, goes to other government agencies, wherever we talk. This building starts shaking like crazy. Now, what should we do? Duck and cover. And hold on. And hold on. There we go. The message, three words, it's actually four, but we tell the kids it's three words. Drop, cover, and hold, or hold on. Get down on the floor, get under a desk if you can, under a table, under a bench, and hold on because stuff in a big earthquake is going to be shaking around. The lights are going to want to come down or at home. If you're not set up just right, stuff is going to want to come flying off the shelves. And I'm glad I'm seeing some people kind of my age, mostly less, but nobody said go to the door. <laughs> Who thought about it? Anybody think we go to the door? Well, be honest, ah, I got one back there, two, three. <laughs> we don't do the door because we have to get up and move to the door. If this building's shaking really violent on an eight or a nine, you're not going to be able to get to the door. You're going to fall down and hurt yourself. Or if you go to a door, the door's going to flop back and forth. 
it's going to hurt you. I uh, heard a story of a it's teacher in Mentasta <laughs> Lake got to her door, holding on to the door. It was the door to her garage, and right behind that door was her water heater. Oh. And it was not strapped down. And as the house rolled that way, the door closed and slammed her arm in the door. Luckily, it didn't break it. She couldn't get out until the house went back the other way. And then a door opened. So we don't do doors. A lot of the kids will say, go to the doors. How many kids are in here today? Oh, man, there's about 30 of us. One, two. I've seen three doors at the most. It's not going to fit. Get under your desk. So that's the message. Just I don't know. We might all drop? fit under this table. Huh? We could all fit under this table. We could almost. It's a great table. So drop, cover, the shoes. Uh -oh. cover, and hold on. You hold on because <laughs> if it's that violent, whatever you're under is going to bounce away from you. Hold on to it. There's, we can go on, drop, cover, and hold, and what you do inside, outside, but we're talking tsunamis tonight. Is it going to happen to me? Is anybody here in 64 in Alaska or in the 64? No? But everybody's heard about it, I bet. Sooner or later, tsunamis are going to come to every coast. They have in the past. They will again. We don't know when. Sometimes people can predict, but our clock is different than Mother Nature's. But it's going to come to the coast. And how big is it going to be? Some of the science is going to tell us, our mapping, how big these waves could possibly be based on the size of the quake. Uh, who hasn't heard about Superstorm Sandy? You know, kind of whacked the East Coast last night, today, day before. You know the nicest thing about that? What were they doing for the last week? They were prepping for it. So we're going to prep for our earthquake next week? Yes, we are. <laughs> but we don't know what's coming. So we hope that we're prepped for it. Uh, just our, our earthquakes, tsunamis, I always say the earthquakes don't have the decent common courtesy to give us a week notice or even a day notice or even an hour's notice, like the storms do. Tornadoes, we can look at weather patterns and see, you know, we got a storm coming. We don't know when the earthquake's going to happen. A near earthquake, and Cindy will talk about the difference between near and far. Well, far one gives us a little bit of time. Would we have 12 hours maybe from Japan? To the west coast. To the west coast. Mm -hmm. yeah, 12 hours, that's not like a week on a storm. So we're going to see them. We hope not on our watch or yours, but we will have uh, earthquakes and tsunamis. How do we protect ourselves? We want you to have a family disaster plan. You should have a, a go kit, survival kit. We've got some handouts in the back uh, to build up a really good survival kit. You go out and buy one or build one from scratch right now. They're pretty spendy to do a good one. So we've got a kind of a layout that you can build it in increments like a week at a time, month at a time, whatever you want to do or can afford. But we want you to have a good disaster plan. With that is a contact plan. How many people, whether you're fishermen, I've talked to a lot of kids, that dad works on the slope, two on a two off or one on one off. Or some people are taking care of family far away for long times and you're split up. And we have the big earthquake here. Or you have the big storm in Wisconsin and the phone lines go down. How are you going to get a hold of each other? There's certain things you can do to make it, I want to say, easier, um, could be, or more uh, possible. Contact uh, family outside. A lot of times when the disaster happens locally, our phone system goes down. Guess what? You can still dial long distance. So call Aunt Mary in Santa Barbara and say, hey, I'm okay. Things are fine. Tell my husband that things are fine. Dad calls home to Aunt Mary and says, oh, I heard from the mom. She's fine. So a good family contact plan. Know your local emergency procedures. Not just for earthquakes or tsunamis, but everything. Fires, floods, snow. I think we're pretty versed in that. Uh, but get with your planning, folks. I've worked with the Samantha working on the mitigation plan. In fact, we're working on that now, aren't we, Joni? To update it. You guys have a good... FEMA approved mit mitigation plan, which does make the city eligible for some special FEMA dollars. Know where to go to survive a tsunami. You're pretty good right here up high. I can look out and see the lights down at the harbor, but 
if you're down at the Reluctant having dinner or you live right down on the edge in White Shed or out at Orca, where's basically anybody? The tsunami shelter in town here. Anybody? The shelter for a tsunami. This, yeah, the elementary school. We want city get to higher ground, but that would be uh, the basic shelter here that we're going to use. Um, prepare your, your kit for seven days. If you read a lot of FEMA stuff, it says be prepared for three days. That might hack it down in the lower 48, uh, but it's not going to hack it in the East Coast this next three days. A lot of damage area. So FEMA and a lot of the other states are going to Alaska's thought on a big disaster for them, seven days. We're not, we're on the road system. Well, you guys are on the road system. Alaska is, in general, we rely on the road to come up. So we want you to be prepared. Now, we don't necessarily have to have the big earthquake right here. Cindy, I'll show you a little bit about a place called Cascadia. That if it whacks the Seattle area or the Northwest, their airports go down, their whole infrastructure goes down, where's all our stuff come up through Seattle. So we want a good seven-day kit in general. So have your disaster kit ready. Also, please, thank you. How are you going to be notified? So what we were talking about with our emergency managers today in our workshop. <coughs> You're going to hear it on your local radio and TV. Did everybody hear the EAS the other night, Saturday night? Most people, to drive you crazy every hour. We want to keep you updated as to <coughs> the, the progress of this. So you're going to hear it on local radio, TV, marine radio. This is a coastal town. There's not too many coastal towns or even riverine towns in Alaska that don't really rely on a marine band radio. Coast Guard's going to put it out over that. Word of mouth is going to go out over it. So that's a good, good way. Local warning systems. See, today's Tuesday. Tomorrow's Wednesday. And at 12 o'clock, what are we going to hear? The, the chimes? You guys have the chimes, right? They're called the Westminster chimes. What do they really sound like? Close encounters, yes. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm working with uh, Paul Trumbly, and we're going to try and get another siren or probably two put in town so that we can get notification a little bit farther out on both ends of town. But you're going to hear it that way. NOAA Weather Radio, I think you guys have pretty good coverage with that here. Uh, that's another way that this is going to come out. In some places, the NOAA Weather Radio tone will kick off local sirens. Not here, but in some of the places. Uh, in your local procedures, if everything goes down, we were told today that you're going to drive around with the police cars and the fire trucks and the PA systems telling you get to higher ground if you're down in the hazard zone. Where do I go to? Kind of hit on that one. You're going to go to your local shelter. Uh, there's a thing called vertical evacuation. It's pretty big in Japan uh, and the West Coast now. Uh, we've come across with some specific uh, building codes to build vertical evacuation shelters. Certain places, if you can't get to high ground, anybody familiar with Ocean Shores, Washington? It's a long sand spit, and they've done a study, and... For Cascadia event, people can't get off of that spit to high ground in time. So they're looking at building, whether it's big tall mounds that they'll design specifically for recreation or something, but at least to get the people up what they expect the ways to be. Uh, in Hawaii Saturday night, a lot of people went to the upper floors in Waikiki, those that couldn't get out of town. That's a vertical evacuation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all yeah. the new hotels now, uh, the building codes are good enough. They, they should be just fine. So do they, they have earthquake building codes. Are those the same as the tsunami building codes? Or? If, if usually if it's going to survive the earthquake from the shaking, it should take the, the way water pounding against it. Uh, if you can't get to higher ground, we want you to move inland as far as you can. Uh, we always get comments from people, hey, if you watched anything on the news last year when Japan hit, some of their stuff went six miles inland up riverbeds, and people live on these riverbeds. We always live by water. So go inland as far as you can if you don't have any higher ground to go to or vertical evacuation. Uh, where are we going to go to here? 
This is the map we've been working on to get the signs ordered and put in place. Wherever you see the little blue arrows, those are going to be our, uh, evacuation signs. Uh, little, there'll be round signs, and you'll see them in a second. Uh, different types of signs, but we're going to work the folks in Orca back in towards town if there's time. If not, we just want them to hit up the hill. And then they'll be scattered around through town trying to lead everybody up towards the school in the safe zone. We've had it for a long time. Uh, They're not up. The state DOT pulled a fast one on us. We ordered the signs okay. a while back. And based on federal highway standards, they were specific size. Okay. And Alaska DOT decided that, well, we want the bigger size, even though it doesn't have to be by federal. They upgraded on us. So. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they will be soon, right? <laughs> but... Uh, Yeah. Before they go up, we have to have approval from DOT. Uh, and the, the intention for the signs is identify your route uh, options, the different zones you're in, and where the shelters are at. And you'll see these signs up and down the West Coast if you go to a tsunami city, a tsunami ready city. You'll see them in Sitka, Valdez, Homer. Uh, we've got nine other, ten other cities, King Cove and Cor Cold Bay. Our, our most two recent ones, we went out there, myself, Cindy, and oh, we actually we never introduced Ann, I'm sorry, uh, Ann, Ann Grevere in the back. She is the state hazard mitigation officer. And Sam. And my boss, and Sam, he's our outreach coordinator for the state for Homeland Security and Emergency Management. He's, yeah, okay. <laughs> she doesn't drink, so I don't have to buy her a beer. <laughs> but the signs you're going to see, and so I heard Susanna say that you saw these in Yekatat. A mm -hmm. couple of different signs you're going to see. You did. They're in Seward, in Seward. Uh, Sitka, Valdez, Homer, Yakutat. Uh, not Whittier yet. Uh, the signs are in Whittier, but they're not up. <laughs> that's that's, that's uh, we, aren't, we aren't naming names. <laughs> 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 uh, Sandpoint, Dutch Harbor, <laughs> King Cove, and Cold Bay. Not they yep. are in Valdez. Yeah, I said them. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of point to Valdez as one of my poster child for Gulf Coast or South Central. George does a fantastic, the fire chief, George Keene, he does a great job down there, as does Dave Squires in Seward mm -hmm. and uh, Bob Painter in Homer. My, my star child for the Aleutians or out west is Jamie Sunderland in, uh, in on Alaska. He's got those people <laughs> wired really good. And our little stars here, Joni and Dick. And Paul, who's taken over recently, you're going to be kind of my favorite children for the, the uh, eastern side of the Gulf Coast. <laughs> Sucking up, right? Yeah. So the signs you're going to see are square ones. So it's going to say it's a hazard zone when you get into a zone you saw on the map. It means that you don't want to be here if the ground shakes real bad or you hear the sirens go off for a tsunami warning. The evacuation area is going to be somewhere where it's a safe place to be. Maybe not a shelter there, but... You know, you can get up to it, and you're out of the inundation zone. The round signs you're going to see, round with an arrow underneath it. The arrow's going to tell you which way to go. I'm going to tell you the story about DOT. I did have some signs that had a pointy on one side and a pointy on the other side. <laughs> and I have a lot of those signs in Seward and Homer and <laughs> Valdez. But when we put them up in Yucatat, the DOT rep said got to take that pointy off one of these signs. Why? Well, because somebody's going to see that and not know which way to go. Where are we going to put a two-headed arrow sign? At a T-intersection? Yeah. Otherwise, no. okay. I didn't want to argue with her, but my personal thought was if they can't figure out which way to go at a T-intersection with arrows pointing both ways, that's chlorine in the gene pool. <laughs> and we're going to see the evacuation <laughs> show. <laughs> The evacuation shelter up at the schoolhouse. I'll pay Cindy a beer for that one, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, root signs, I've already explained these, so I'll shoot through them. The root sign's going to show us which way to go, and you're going to see them along the roadway. Uh, I've been changing the signs out from the, so the actually, the, these signs are in Oregon, but I've got, 
we're taking pictures as we put them up in the different cities in Alaska. The hazard zone, this one is in uh, Sand Point, down at their harbor. You'll see those down at the harbor here too. Mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna see the, the evacuation areas once you get to high ground or when you get to the shelter. We all know what tsunamis can do as far as damage and who hasn't seen any of the pictures I have are actually from Sumatra. 2004 but who hasn't seen any of the recent ones from Japan last year incredible damage that these things can do uh, Seward in 1964 we still always go back to that because that's our famous one that's the second largest earthquake ever recorded and we killed a lot of people with that one we exported it out of state uh, and the damage by these things is is incredible Kodiak who hasn't seen these pictures before they're the standards for uh, Alaska disaster pictures but some of the stuff that we saw from Indonesia, satellite pictures before the waves come through, everything's gone. Uh, housing area, not a lot, not a ton of trees, but just a, your typical neighborhood in Indonesia. And the waves come through. Hello. There we go. Pretty much everything was gone. It just scours this stuff out. The waves come in and they start breaking stuff up and it loosens it and all this debris goes inland and then the wave draws back and everything that's knocked down it carries back out and just strips the land clean the treed areas while the trees are going to stop all this stuff that'll be okay if you're living in that one big huge solid building in the middle they do tremendous damage so when uh what we want you to remember drop cover and hold when the ground shakes uh, violently or a certain uh, 20 seconds or longer that's going to be your key to evacuate to higher ground and Cindy will explain the reasons for that with her her stuff no oh sure <laughs> uh, and we tell the kids this the kids are always our greatest avenue to the families we'll do schools and then we'll see them in the store or somewhere later on and the kids are going oh we know that we know those and they told us to drop cover and hold on and we really love talking to the kids it does only if you are where is it oh it's not on there oh it got it it should say if at the coast on the beach thank you that's the only time that we say move during the earthquake because if you're feeling it that bad and we're down at the harbor, those waves are going to come in really quick in a matter of minutes. This I don't know. I These don't guys know. will take time and get data as the longer the time goes by and they can look at their instrumentation. They'll be able to tell us exactly how far it cracked and how long it did that and I've maybe too early for that yet or you she hasn't been home long enough since then to six minutes six, our 64 rattled for five minutes and the waves in Seward came in I want to say 90 seconds 45 to 90 seconds because they had local slumping and those waves came in fast so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up I will fix that slide if you're at the coast <laughs> it knocks you down and you can't stand up after 20 seconds, get to higher ground. Was that five minutes yep. That was five minutes conti continuing shaking, nonstop for five minutes. We've got some survivor interviews. And when I hear them, the hairs on my neck stand up. They're, they're incredible interviews. When I've done stuff with kids before on earthquakes, we uh, used floats and had the kids stand and try to balance on the floats and had them drug, try to do that for five minutes. And after about 30 seconds, I think, isn't it five minutes? That's a great idea. Five okay. minutes? Five we minutes isn't that long. Minutes. But you listen to the people in these interviews. <laughs> you listen to the people in the interviews talk about that five minutes went on forever. Uh, remember, don't go to the coast to watch the tsunami. <laughs> Hello? Unless you live in Crescent City, it seems like those folks always go down. People do it. Last year after Japan, we lost one person in the U.S. down in California. He went down to take pictures of the waves. I think three other people got pulled into the waves. They, they got rescued, but one guy didn't, and he was found miles up the coast in Oregon. 
So we don't go to the coast to watch the waves. We don't go back to the coast after the first wave. There are going to be a series of waves that are going to last for hours and sometimes days. Uh, if you see something weird going on at the coast, that's an indication. And she's got some pretty cool stuff you'll see what you're looking for. And the kids, the kids were great in, the, in class the other day. Last two times, and when I'm talking to little kids, when a third grader sees a picture that she's got, she's asking, is this a real tsunami or a fake wave? And these little third graders are going, that's the China boar tide. <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding me? I didn't know that the first time she showed it. So our, our kids are great. True story. Why? Not it's, it's great. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yesterday. Two different classes and two of the little ones. So, that's the China board times. Like, she's going, have you been through this before? It's great. We love the kids. Uh, so if you see something weird going on at the coast, get to higher ground. Get your radio on, watch the radio TV, listen for your sirens, but get to higher ground. All the education that we do is, is not any good. Or, I'm sorry, wow, that was... What? Way backwards. <laughs> Ooh, so I'm going, oh, here come the daggers. La, la, la. <laughs> All the science that we have to do this, and our scientists give us great information, gathering the data from past stuff and current stuff, telling us what we need to do. But without the proper education, that science doesn't do us any good if you guys don't know what to do after you get the warning. So I'm big on the education part of it. My science buddy over here, who's the science person, guess what? She's big on the education part. Science, we need the science to know how to educate the people. And that's why I like working with her so much that I work with other science and all they want is more money to do more maps. Ah, I want your maps, but I need the maps for a specific reason. So all the other stuff isn't gonna do us any good, the science, if we don't have the knowledge of what to do with it. Educated, aware public, you're going to know what to do when the time comes. I think you should still stand up. I think we should still be standing and stretching, literally stretching, and Herb's going to count 20 for me as soon as we all get up. Okay? Everybody up. I'm sorry. Don't you apologize. Okay. In fact, you could stretch even on one leg, and we're going to pretend we're in an earthquake. The house is shaking. The house is shaking. 20 seconds. This is important. Go. And I have to use her favorite thing. One chocolate, two, two chocolate, three, chocolate, four, chocolate, five, chocolate, six, six chocolate, seven, seven chocolate, eight, chocolate, nine, nine chocolate, ten, ten chocolate, eleven, chocolate, twelve, chocolate, thirteen, chocolate, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen chocolate, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Woohoo! Thank you. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> Thank you. She knew that was coming, didn't she? Joni rocks. All right. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, let's launch this guy. It is touchy. All right, guys. This is a video from Honshu last year. Uh, this is actually a salesman, and everybody who works for this company has a camera mounted on their dashboard. It films everything they do every day. Okay, he cannot. He's about to. Cars moving. See the earthquake. What we're missing on this part is a review mirror. If you look up in the green circle, that is the main tsunami current. Think about how long ago the earthquake was. This is real time. This is real time. Here's the review mirror. Mirror. Yes, sir. Real time. So, stay with you, Bobby Ogonima. Kuruma comes in you, Kiana. So, you see, I had a new Hajime. These guys are on the Kuruma Sanga Mada, Shanae, Tomate. 
室賀さんの車は前方の黒いワゴン車に近づくワゴン車の中には男性の姿が。この衝突の直後逃げることを考え窓を開けたという画面手前のガレキや車が右方向にゆっくりと流れる一方で画面奥ではものすごいスピードでトラックが左方向に流されていく。衝突したワゴン車の中にいた男性が車の上に避難しているのも見えるそしてと向きを変えるという車するとカメラは建物の合間から落ちるとあの瞬間に流れを捉えた車の中では別の場所で起きた津波の被害を伝える放送が The most common injury during a tsunami is to the feet because people evacuate barefoot usually. But the most common cause of death is sudden impact trauma to the head from being whacked by stuff. この時、ムロガさんは車内でいつ車から脱出するか考え続けていたという。You're right there with my daughter. She's, she's a new driver, right? She's like, Mom, the windshield wiper's still working. So, this is a little bit more. 別の車が流れに揉まれていた<笑>回転を始めた車は室賀さんを乗せたまま津波に流され続ける。そして津波遭遇からおよそ4分半車が建物に衝突し水に沈んだところで映像は撮影。And the reason that we know this is because he actually released a longer video truly narrating it with captions taking us back to the scene the car was recovered after, the film was recovered after. But that company mounts the cameras on the dash of every car they own. So everywhere they go in town, which means, man, if we could actually get a hold of that company, we would have a lot of footage, wouldn't we? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's awesome that he took the footage. Unfortunately, he yanked The longer explained version off of YouTube before I could type it. So this is on YouTube? That one is absolutely, and all you have to do is Japan as seen from car, Japan tsunami seen from car, or you can send me a note and I'll send it to you. It's all good, okay? Alrighty. Irv's gonna help me drive, especially if I get confused. Well, it's not. It is this absolutely really, really fun, cool remote mouse. Okay. Really fast. 20 seconds is a magnitude 7 earthquake. It's pretty easy to remember. 20 seconds. Irv brought up 20 seconds down by the coast. The main thing to really think about with this is in a magnitude 9, we can shake for five minutes. Was your question? I have no idea how long Saturday night's earthquake shook for I'm in BC. And I can honestly tell you, and I don't mean to be derogatory when I say this, the Canadians are so polite. They won't tell us about damage. They're just, oh, there wasn't anything. It was okay, we're fine. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> I really do want the details, please. So、um, we're not getting any information yet.、Um, 
So I don't know how long it shook, but I'm going to guess it shook for at least 30 seconds. Our rule of thumb is 30 seconds is an eight. Now, when I count chocolate, I usually go to what, 35, 40? Yeah. Because uh, who's been in an earthquake? Yeah, it's, that's, time's weird, isn't it? Time gets weird. So learning how to count during an earthquake when things are breaking and things are moving and who knows who might be screaming, right? We didn't have screaming in that one. Um, Learning how to count is really important. The reason I want you to count your favorite thing is that is actually a total psychological, emotional thing. If you're thinking of something nice, that's a good thing, right? We want you to think of something nice. I so, chocolate. chocolate rocks. Thank you, Joni. <laughs> awesome. Um, I used to teach for Prince William Sound Community College, believe it or not, up in up in Glen Allen, and uh, chocolate was on my syllabus, and I meant it. You could bribe me with chocolate without. Seven seven. Mm -hmm. It was a seven seven, absolutely. So, um, but a magnitude seven is enough to generate a local landslide, which is enough to generate a local tsunami, which is going to happen absolutely as fast as that, in less than two minutes' time. Now, I've worked at the warning center for a long, long time, and we can, you know, we can solve an earthquake within two to three minutes. We usually can get the warning out in five. Once it gets through the whole dissemination system, it might be more like 15 before you get it. But the truth is, is I don't want you to even count on the actual warning system. If there's a local event, the earthquake is your warning. Right? This has taught us we don't have time, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't have time even to get out of the car. Did you guys notice in the beginning the guy that like got out of the car and then he went back and he closed the door? Like, wow. Okay. Cool. Anyway, so 20 seconds, you're near the water. I'm asking you to evacuate during a very dangerous situation during a live event, a live magnitude 9 earthquake where things are breaking and the, the ground is really rolling. I want you to get out of your safe place and get a high ground. I'm only going to pull you out of your safe place if you're next to the water, okay? I mean, the main thing that we learned from sewer, people couldn't even get on the roofs fast enough, right? So 20 seconds, only if you're near the coast. Otherwise, please stay in place. Please stay safe. And then when it's done, you can put on some hot water for your neighbors that are coming up the hill. Okay. Good? Good. Okay. So, see now, isn't that funny? That's how that player is. It just won't have a couple of videos loaded at once. It's really, really odd. I guess. It's my computer, so it probably is. It's federal. OK, now this guy is not going to open with the VLC. He's going to open with something else. Let's play with Easy Player. Do you remember this, Alan? Years ago, every player, oh, it was miserable. OK, let's bring it home, huh? Yeah. This one's great. Oh, come on, load for me. You guys know Harry? Oh, yeah. The announcer in English, and he said there had been a terrible earthquake. He said, Valdez has been wiped out. Cordova has been wiped out. And that was his words. Come on. <laughs> it's hard to explain how that hits you when you've got a wife and kids in the announcer says that the towns have been wiped out. Kids, yeah. And uh, right away I called Cordova. Bingo, they came back. And it was like a breath of heaven because the end said, we're fine, Harry. Don't listen to that Anchorage broadcaster. So we went on and done our work. And, and as we went around the sound, we seen devastation you couldn't believe and was just filling shelves when all of a sudden it started to shake. The first, I'd felt earthquakes before, but a little tiny thing. When this one hit, it started to shake and things started falling off the shelves. But I'll tell you this, it was noisy, extremely noisy. A crunching, grinding noise. And at the same time, when the poles would flip in opposite directions. The line would go twing or twang or something. If you looked up the street, you could see waves coming down the street. 
just like the ocean. I could feel the movement on the floor. So I went and I always heard the older people say, open the door. When there's an earthquake, you need to open the door. So I went and opened the door and I grabbed the two kids and went outside with them. Water was getting real rough. Then the water went out. The water started going out. You could see more of the beach. And somebody, I don't know who, somebody hollered uh, tidal wave. And we turned around and started just running, running up. And then the water just vanished, just like it fell in a hole. And when that hole closed up, it was like it shot it all back up. We're sitting in there, and all of a sudden, it, it, about 10 minutes after we were down the dock, it uh, started shaking. And when I looked out, I seen all these telephone poles are falling down and sparks flying all over the place, you know, electricity. And uh, they all jumped in my car. And we were heading out the road. When we were heading out the road, the ground opened up in front of us and, and then closed and water chewed up about 30 feet up in the air. After we got to Copper Center, I called home. I tried to get a hold of uh, in, anybody that knew what happened down in the village. They, they told me that the village of Schneegel was wiped out. It's a big, big loss to me in the uh, Geneva. It, it just wouldn't stop. It just continued. And, and not only did it continue, but it just became stronger and stronger and stronger. And it was just that real violent sharp shaking and uh and i thought maybe the boiler at the elementary school had blown up i don't that usually meant no school the heat would be off but at the same time this this shaking is continuing and all the dishes are coming down out of the cabinets in the kitchen and glass was breaking and so it finally ended but it really was I think close to five minutes, and that's a long, long time for earthquakes. All of a sudden, just at the front door is my father, and he's yelling, there's a tidal wave coming, we have to get to the top of the roof. Just see him so clear in my mind, standing down there with, with my stuff, and I'm just just screaming at him, it, it, it doesn't matter, just, just you have to get up here, and you don't, you don't have any time to waste, and so he did. and. It, um, we jumped, and it seems as if as soon as my dad got onto the house roof, and we, we were all lying down with our hands and heads um, at the pitch of the roof and holding hands, that wave just hit so hard and so fast um, that, that just in an instant, um, what had been a subdivision of probably 11 homes was instantly just gone. Everything just exploded or flattened. But uh, when that wave was coming down on us, we didn't worry about it too much because we knew from being sailors that waves out on the ocean travel about 15, 18 miles an hour. This baby was going about 50 miles an hour. And it was standing up anywhere from 30 to 50 feet high and there was some white water peeling right off the top of it. And I jumped into a, an M37 military three-quarter ton pickup that we had there. And, uh, and I took off and started driving it inland. And I didn't go 20 feet till that wave hit and just turned me up going end over end of that pickup. And I was underwater enough to where I was drowning. And um, I was getting a lot of mud and water and dirt into my lungs and into my Road and um, then about that time the waves started going back to the ocean and started taking me back. I was going back toward the ocean. I grabbed a, an alder there and hung on to the water drained away and there I was, I was just like a beach sea lion laying there. He went up and stayed up quite a ways in the mountainside there until everybody came up. We knew who, who made it, who didn't make it about then. Yeah, Nick Kumkoff, he was hanging on to three daughters and trying to hang on a pole. 
she ended up losing two and saving one. And what kept her there was the, the zipper caught when the water was going out. The zipper caught and stayed, and that's what kept her there. But the oldest and the middle girl didn't make it. I was lucky enough to be interviewing those interviews. So it's just every time I hear them, it's something else. And one thing that, that that video is edited by the state of Alaska, part of uh, Irv and Sam and Ann's team. I think he did a lovely job, didn't he? Yeah. One of the things that Avis spoke about was that while, of course, of course, Chinigua was right near the epicenter of 1964, and so they had the shaking. This video is seven minutes long. It shook for at least five. So that's pretty much, we can take that length of time. That's the shaking the whole time. But it's not just shaking. I mean, it's really rolling. Really, really rolling. It's a big deal. And she talked about the dock shaking. One of the tsunami's natural warning signs in an area like Prince William Sound is that the water might get sucked out. Can't count on it, but it might happen. <clears throat> and it happened there, so it got sucked out, and their dock was completely dry, and they could see it bouncing during the earthquake, and then the tsunami came back in while it was bouncing. So <clears throat> imagine trying to maneuver yourself during a, a really monstrously rolling event and getting up to the school and holding on to your children has a very, very difficult time. So, yeah, Alan. Well, like the PNS way, when, when you're actually feeling the earthquake, do you know how much vertical or horizontal displacement you're actually going through yourself I mean, like in your house or vehicle? When you're just, are we talking feet? Or? We're talking feet. We're talking meters, possibly. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a couple block diagrams that might help with that. I, I'm, I can't answer it directly because every event is so unique. It depends on how shallow it is, and it also depends on what kind of rock you're standing on, you know, whether you're on gravels or on bedrock or not. Um, one of the things that came up, uh, Susanna, maybe you asked whether or not uh, earthquake building codes are good for tsunamis. Oh, yeah. And um, for the most part they are, but in places that aren't worried about tsunamis, there's extra building codes that go into tsunamis that strictly earthquake zones won't take in or don't need to take into effect. But uh, for tsunamis, it's nice being up on stilts. Like one of the things the gal in Seward, what happened there was the, fourth of the force of the tsunami actually went under her house and picked the whole thing up. They were lucky it didn't explode the house. So they rode it on the roof. And I think they went over a quarter mile up valley on their roof. Yeah. 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 And they were picked up and floated along. But stilted homes actually still do better <laughs> because that energy can travel underneath. underneath. Yeah. Whereas a flat floored home is actually going to get picked up like an entity. It might, at least, is what we've seen. All right. Thanks, Irv. I'm really glad we had that. Ah. Mm. Okay, so now we can do it with this. Will you help me? <laughs> I'm like, no. Nah. I just trust you explicitly and fully. I know, I know, I know. We worked together so long. All right. Who's come to visit us in Palmer? Yay, 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 a few people. Anybody who hasn't, please, right now, consider yourselves invited to come visit us in Palmer. Say, I went over there, and uh, they told me to come back Thursday. So They've told you to come back Friday. Yeah, I really suck. I mean, I, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a lot of time. I totally get it. And it was Tuesday, and I know there had to be somebody sitting at their, their desk. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have to do. All I want to do is just get a basic overview of the, the facility. 
So open tours are on Fridays <laughs> at 1, 2, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and you will uh, be subjected to only an hour's worth of time. Otherwise, if you know you're coming to town, please send me an email. Yeah, if you want the funding, I, I work on your public relations. <laughs> you can send me an email, and I'll meet you there, and I'll give you a tour, honestly. Or I will work with some of the more friendlier of the really introverted scientists, <laughs> super introverts that have a very hard time talking to people. There's a few of them there that are awesome. So if I know you're coming ahead of time, we'll get you, we'll get you a tour set up, okay? Yeah. Um, I'm more, I grew up in Florida. Mm -hmm. We had hurricanes. Yes, you do. Yeah. And we were just talking about silk. Mm -hmm. Our silk uh, our silk houses are designed in a hurricane system that the stairs and any uh, buildings underneath the silk are designed to break away. Hmm. That's nice. And we're not that evolved. But I like the concept. That's a really interesting concept, and it's something that we can certainly pass on to the structural engineers. You know, the, the earthquakes uh, are very damaging, as we know. But God, a few days' notice. <laughs> it's just so cool. And clearly, you have some evolved engineering. <laughs> We're working on it. But I'm, I'm nice to hear that. Um, Sure. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, it makes complete sense. It's not some kind of anchor that's going to twist the structure in any way. No, it's cool. I, I like it. Yeah. I, I can add to that. In our riverine communities in Alaska, <laughs> uh, people will come in. We will do elevations for folks that are near the river but don't have to move back because there's no erosion. But one of the requirements of an elevated house for those folks is you will leave the bottom of it opened up. Now they can close it during winter time for insulation, but during the flood season they have to take their sheeting off or whatever. And if, then if they get damaged again because of storing stuff under there, they're not supposed to, but if the floods come up and damages the house because they had sheeting, people won't help them recover from that. So that huh. is, that's a requirement. That's why you see all those Gulf Coast homes yeah. sitting up on a stilt that lets the water through and it doesn't tear walls down. And you went that's hilarious. He could just interrupt. It's totally fine. <laughs> um, by the way, cindy.preller at noah.gov. I'm quite serious about sending me an email if you want to come see the center. Okay. And of course, Joni knows how to get a hold of me. Alan and Susanna do. And really, it's so cool, you guys. When you walk in there, there's these gleams everywhere. So, so go there. Imagine that. Oh. <laughs> and you can see the earthquakes anywhere in the world. Go ahead. Yeah. Looks something like that. It's a 24 by 7 by 2. <laughs> Go ahead, hit it. I just think it's dorky. <laughs> I just think it's dorky, but. It's there for my mentor, Bruce, who was the outreach coordinator before me. Um, anyway, clearly it's me and the guys, and, and seriously, I'm not kidding about the introverts. Um, we, there's no such thing as a degree in tsunamis. To be a tsunami cyst or a tsunamiologist, you basically have to cross train. So I'm a geologist, but we have physicists, we have oceanographers, um, we even have an astrophysicist. We design our own software. We design our own hardware. I mean, the vaults that we put our seismometers out in, they were designed on site. I mean, it's very Alaskan, very resilient. OK? I know. It's fun, though. It makes us pause. And so even though we're this itty-bitty little center staffed with 14 people, we're responsible for the continent. We're the only one. We're Everything in yellow. Yeah. How is that the West Coast, though? How is that? Great question. <laughs> that is. Yeah, we've, we've tried, actually, for the last six years to change our name to the North American Tsunami Warning Center because the folks on the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, yeah. they get a message from Alaska. <laughs> like, huh, who are you? 
And uh, I mean, we are really about as exotic as something like Australia or, you know, somewhere in Southern Africa, you know, sometimes. So yeah, it's a political issue. There are folks, sadly in Florida, I'm sorry, hun, but they, they are just totally opposed to us changing our name. So we're still working on it. Um, Mm, is that the issue? Hmm. Okay. Um, anyway, we've got a lot of country and we've got a lot of U.S. lives and property. Our mission is U.S. lives and property, right? So as far as the continent goes, most of the lives and property are in that yellow line. Go ahead. We have a sister center in Hawaii. Kind of looks like they've taken over the world, doesn't it? <laughs> There is definitely a competition between the centers, and it's absolutely silly. And so because I'm in the yellow, I have to tell you, PTWC is only responsible for Hawaii. <laughs> well, and also the American properties in the Pacific, so like Guam and the Marianas. The rest of the world ocean, um, we issue advisory warnings for. We can't tell another country to evacuate. It's up to them to do that. And by the way, I can't even tell you to evacuate. That's up to your local emergency managers to do that. All I can do is recommend it. We back each other up, so we're both actually responsible for the whole mess. Okay, the next slide. The rest of the world has warning centers. So it really is unto US domination. And the best one on the planet is Japan without question. Absolutely. It's not that 25,000 people died, only 25,000 people died. It should have been hundreds and hundreds of thousands, probably in the millions. So the fact that their, their warning system is so fast and they practice so often. I mean, it's, it's, it was an amazing event last year. It, it blew every single physicist, seismologist, and geologist. It blew all of our minds. It broke all the rules. How strong was that earthquake? It was three earthquakes in two minutes. A seven nine, an eight eight, and a nine. Three great, three separate great quakes. They all three happened in two minutes' time. Oh, they were all right on top of each other. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm were yeah. they different in depth or? Not, not by much. Okay. Not worthy of really differentiating. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, was that 2005? 2004. 2004. Mm hmm Yeah, Boxing Day. Watching uh, CNN, or uh, not CNN, uh, CSAN. Mm hmm uh, The um, director of the um, United Nations, I believe, is from a Nordic country, I think, Sweden. Okay. Okay. And um, he talked like uh, it was just an act of nature. And it made me so mad to hear him talk. And I, I, he said that there was no way to do this. It was impossible to forget. <laughs> and that I, I got 150 uh, emails to send to the Maldives, everywhere, all those places. And I sent out the same email. Um, telling them about what you guys do. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm sad for him that he hasn't been educated, wasn't educated. Um, there's an island directly across from Banda Aceh, very, very, very near the epicenter, and they actually have a legend that the it's a lullaby that is sung to the children about a great quake and the ocean receding go to high ground. They evacuated and saved over 80,000 people. I think, I think just a handful, maybe 10 got hurt. And most of their homes are destroyed. And this isn't, this isn't a, a, a village that is, I mean, they're, they're aboriginal people, but they have electricity, cars, you know, I mean, they're very advanced. They felt the earthquake, they saw the water go out, they've all been raised with this lullaby and they all evacuated just fine. And that was the distance like Cook Inlet is wide. So we're looking like from Mount Reed out to Homer, the distance from Aceh where 200,000 people died. So as far as I'm concerned, 
education, 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 right? So I'm sad for that gentleman. But thank you very much. Okay, the screws, huh? I have a question. Um, the Japanese, so you say the Japanese system is, um, you know, really, they, they can notify their people really quickly. Um, how soon after um, the event last year, did the pilots get the sirens go off? They didn't have to I'd say it's probably 30 to 40 seconds. They were that on it. I mean, it, they had the magnitude up and the tsunami warning out while the ground was still shaking. I mean, immediately. Absolutely. If we have time later, I have a video I can show you. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, what do we do? We locate earthquakes. That's what we do. Okay. We need three seismometers to triangulate. Okay. We like to have four for depth. At the warning center, we really won't issue a magnitude until we have at least seven. That makes sense. In 1964, there were three in the state. There was one in ADAC, one in Fairbanks, one in Sitka. So the thing to think about is we went from 64 was just under 50 years ago, right? We had almost no instrumentation on the planet. And now this is how many seismometers we're monitoring real time, live, 24 7, over 800. Absolutely. Absolutely. It kind of looks like we aren't getting data from China or Russia or India. They're just not sharing it. That's right. They certainly have excellent science there. And China actually has great data, but it comes in 30 seconds. The timing's off by 30 seconds, so we actually can't calibrate it because it's not exactly 30. It's 29 on one station and 31 on another. And you know. So uh, ironically, it's not like we don't can't see what they're doing. I, I was on duty for the North Korean test a few years ago, and I bet you I saw that about as soon as they did. And then the State Department showed up at the door. It's like, whoa! Okay. On the left column over there are those seismometers listed vertically. This is what an earthquake looks like when it's arriving, kind of like a flock of geese. <coughs> Excuse me. So, of course, the, the, the foremost station is the one that is closest to the epicenter. And then as the earthquake radiates out, the other stations will pick it up. Wow, Vanna, you rock. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Even if we have noise on stations, you can sure tell where the earthquake is, can't you? Okay. All righty. Thank you, Irv, by the way. This is uh, what a warning looks like. Um, the EIS system in Alaska has sadly been vexed with some very old equipment for a long time. It's in the midst of evolving now. You guys, we are all experiencing that pain together as it evolves. And uh, that was part of the problem this weekend with the EAS triggering and some of the text was garbled. Sometimes it went off too often, but we've got equipment that we're upgrading all over the place. So bear with us as we test it. Sadly, we need events to test it. Okay, go ahead. The other thing we do while we're on is, uh, this is a history of all the tsunamis in our region. So Irv, if you click out near the 1946 event right there, you might have to click on it twice. Hmm. There you go. Now you can go click on 1946. I know. It's fun. It's good for us to breathe and have yoga with the mouse. <laughs> we will be one with the mouse. Maybe. You're almost there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's in the center, and it's the second to largest square on the rift. Oh, you're going to go back there for me. Thank you. I'm sorry, hon. Ah, good enough. There you go. She got it. That was pretty quick. Thank you. Sorry, sweetie. Anyway, we can click on any one of these squares, and it'll immediately bring up the magnitude, and it'll bring up the locations and the wave heights. For a local tsunami, like our 22nd situation, 15 meters is about 45 feet of water. The other, you know, eight meters is still pretty big in Sam Bay, but the rest of them, a meter, that's about three feet, but this is down in California. 
But we can bring this up pretty quick. And because our science is so young, the history is critical to know. And a lot of the way we get the history is through stories. OK. So that, on that event, that mm -hmm. tells you that the Scotch cap was is that right near the epicenter. So that's why you were expecting wave heights that were predicting wave heights that large. These are actually measured wave heights. Measured? Yep. So this is 1957. But yes, that's right. It was near Scotch Cap, so that's why it got such a large amount of water. Um, and so it tells me if I have an epicenter near that tsunami area, I can expect those kind of wave heights. That whole, if it happened in the past, it probably could happen again. The, it, that's like the golden rule of geology. OK. Go ahead. Where's it going to happen? I fell into a ring of fire. Look at you. <laughs> I fell into a ring of fire. a little bit of Johnny, don't we? I went down. <laughs> Everybody knows the ring of fire, right? You all know you live on the ring of fire, correct? Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Let's keep going. All right. Once we get a feel for the magnitude, we are not the um, definitive source for earthquakes. The USGS is the National Earthquake Information Center in Golden. It's their call. So as soon as we know it might generate a tsunami, we just toss the seismicity over to them, let them go ahead and handle the analysis of the earthquake, and we look at the water. Because we don't know if, it ha if there's a tsunami or not until we've measured it. And unfortunately, if we're measuring it, it's hitting somewhere. Right. OK, go ahead. This is what a tsunami looks like when it arrives at a tide gauge. This is Shimia, one of the outside Aleutian Islands. The bottom axis is hours. The side axis is centimeters. This tells me a lot. And it, it has a low tide sequence, um, tidal range, Shimia does. It's not at all like here or Cook Inlet that has you know up to 20, 30 feet in places. Shimia is pretty mellow. So we do have a high, high tide and a low tide there. This guy is coming in, going into low tide. But you can see it's several waves. So a tsunami is clearly many waves. You can see the first wave is not that big. The biggest wave is almost always two to three hours later. But we can't even count on that one being the biggest one, right? This also tells me that the Earth moved up first because the first motion is up. Water doesn't compress, so a seismic signal travels through the water just fine. Looks like an earthquake. It is an earthquake. OK. So this is what a couple of, these are called marigrams. They're tide, tide gauge records. This top one, this is from Honshu. The top one is on site in Japan. Now, when Honshu happened, actually, Irv and I were chatting on Facebook, and the first thing I did was go look at the Japanese tie gauges live, which, by the way, you can do too. They're online, they're live, you can definitely see them. And so the first thing I did was go, okay, and I mean, I saw this thing spike, and I'm like, uh oh. I saw it spike maybe three, four times, and then it went dead. That's a bad sign. And the next thing she did is said, get off the computer, we're going to work. Yeah. I'm like, get in. And he's like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, no, 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 no. Get in there. This thing's huge. All right, so this next one is actually um, an Aleutian quake. So you can see the character of the signal is a little bit different. Should we, should we go there? You want me to go there? There's, I can't take you there because I can't physically take you there, but I can describe it to you. Tsunami.gov, okay? You can get to our website easiest with tsunami.gov, uh -huh. and then hit West Coast and Alaska Tsunami Warning Center, because uh -huh. the only other option is Hawaii. So come to ours. And then on the left, you'll see tie gauges. Okay. Click on tie gauges, and it'll take you to a list of tie gauges all over the world. Okay. And they're all live, real time, all the time. Okay. And you can see them if they're not being wiped out, right? <laughs> so the character of the event, this is a local tsunami for Japan right here, one of the biggest they've ever experienced. This is what it looked like in Alaska still very serious. And the other thing is the Japan event went on for more than four days. And on day four, it was still as tall as it was on day one. So before that wow. red line, that's what it normally looks like on the left. 
Correct. Actually, the green one is basically detided. Detided. We've taken the tide out, so all you see is a tsunami. The blue line is the tide. The red is the data coming in. And then when you take the tide out, then you just have the tsunami in green. Whether or not a tsunami arrives at a high or low tide matters greatly in some places. And if you have a 20 to 30 foot tidal flux, I sure would rather it arrived at low tide, right? If it's going to go on for four days, it doesn't mean you won't deal with it at high tide, but low tide gives you a little more time. Are you saying that the tsunami lasted for four days? I mean, oh, the tsunami itself lasted for more than seven. Wow. So how does, what does that mean? Did it like go back and forth across the yeah, ocean basin? Yeah, it did. Yeah, we had three full reflections. So it's almost like your bathtub, just make it the Pacific, right? We had three full reflections that came across, hit us, hit South America, went back, hit Japan, came back, hit us, went back. So day four, it was just as tall as it was on day one. So it takes about two days to do that? It takes about 12 to 20 hours to cross the ocean. Five to seven hundred miles an hour, as fast as a jet out in the open ocean. Did they lose anybody? Uh, not thinking. Or people were thinking, okay, it's over. They go down and. You know, we lost people in Northern California that went down to watch it and take pictures of it. Right? Um, that happens a lot. I actually don't believe that happened on this event. But that is probably one of the biggest things we educate for. There's going to be more than one wave. It's going to go on for days. In Alaska, we want you to evacuate for at least a week. We want you to plan on a week. That's hard. People don't want to be without their cell phones for a week, let alone water, yeah. right? Um, I actually cannot answer your question because there are so many islands. I mean, it hit every piece of property in the Pacific. So it's possible that happened. So waiting for the end, so you know it's over if nothing's happened for like 48 hours. You know what, we know it's over kind of like when this thing goes flatline, the heartbeat's gone. Mm -hmm. But it may take days to mellow out, but you'll watch it mellow out. We know it's over when Cindy's <laughs> <laughs> I called Frank Shearer at 3 a.m. Sunday morning and I said, he's the fire chief in Ketchikan. I said, Frank, it's over. And we'll talk about it tomorrow. He's like, yeah, okay. I'm like, I'm sorry I called you at three. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Are those, uh, each one of those crests and depressions, is that a wave height or that you measure? Yes, sir. So, is that in? That's in centimeters. Three. Centimeters. Okay. Yeah. So, in centimeters, um, we work on basically a meter is, is warning threshold. So anything that we're expecting over a meter in height, three feet. It's a yardstick, basically, right? So anything over three feet in height is warning threshold. We are expecting damage, but not just damage. We're expecting it to come inland where homes are. And anything between a foot or 30 centimeters in a meter, we want you to clear the harbor, close the harbor, and we want you to clear the beaches. Because that's still damaging, crazy wild currents, but not enough to evacuate the town. Um, the thing on these scales is you got to watch because the, the scale on the left, even if it's in meters, it may be changed the distance between. So like that's zero to 60 over there, I think, and this one's zero to 80. And we do what we can to make it fit on the screen, mm -hmm. right? So. Well, for like us here in Cordova, it would probably depend on which area the epicenter was and which way the tsunami is coming from as to how it would affect Cordova with all the island places and stuff. That's true absolutely everywhere. And the other thing with Cordova, which is super interesting and very unique, and not just Cordova, but Cordova, Yakutaga, Yakutat, is this whole corner of the basin tends to uplift. Mm -hmm. So what happened to you guys in 64 is the harbor drained, right? And then all the boats fell over. That's a problem. That's damage from that. As far as the tsunami itself, what I understand is it came in so slow you could walk next to it, right? I, I think you took me out there last time, yeah. White Shed Road. Um, that's because the Copper River has deposited so much silt that you've got a nice shallow shelf out here and that all that sediment actually slows the tsunami down before it can get to you. Okay, the other thing we do is we crank out travel time maps, so each band is an hour. This, uh, I mean, out in the open ocean, it's pretty consistent, five to seven hundred miles an hour, and we, this is actually pretty accurate within about ten minutes. Okay. 
The other thing we can do is if we, if we have enough data is we'll model the energy coming off of the event. And I love this one because it actually confirms that the tsunami is the entire water column, seafloor to sea surface. The tsunami itself in this one, this is a 2006 Russian event. It was two hours late in Crescent City. And our harbor master's out there, clear glass water, nice afternoon. Where's my tsunami? Right, it's supposed to be here two hours ago. And what had happened was the energy got uh, hooked up there in the Emperor Seamount. I knew you were going to go there. You're so great. And then got redirected and channeled along the Mendocino Ridge, which brought it in. You can see that little chunk coming in right there. Brought it in two hours late. So there you go. Okay. We also. It went right over Hawaii. It, it did. Did. It then it did do some damage in Hawaii, but not too bad. It actually went just weird to the right of it. Um, the other thing we do is we model. We have several different kinds of modeling we do on the fly. Okay. Oh, up. Yeah, there's rift. This is uh, the model that PTWC uses. Okay, one more. And then this is our model. And this model in particular is Cascadia, which is from the Mendocino Ridge in Northern California all the way up to Vancouver Island. We have a seismic gap there. The last major event was in 1700. The reoccurrence interval, well, he said five to 900 years, but we still kind of think 350 to 900 years. So 1700 was their last large event. So we're pretty much expecting it any time because in geology, you got to give or take about what 10,000 thousand anyway. So, okay. So here is a, this is, this is our model that we generate on the fly. So this is, this is it for Cascadia. There's a red line about a third of the way across. That's a meter. So anything above a meter is a warning. So why is Ivanoff Bay and Perigo, which is right next to each other, so different? Is it because the orientation is what you're It's also the about? shape of the bay and how shallow it is. Yep. Um, and then there's a dashed line right there. Thank you, Swerve. That's 30 centimeters. So we're going to issue an advisory if we're expecting it to be over 30 meters, 30 centimeters in height, which is just a foot of water, but still it's decent. If it's over a meter, if we're forecasting that, we'll issue a warning. Now, the thing that is important to remember that was demonstrated this weekend, we issued a warning without any of this kind of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that, those first three messages that we issued were based on magnitude, just the seismic magnitude alone. We, we, you don't have a decent, it takes about 20 minutes for the seismic waves to wrap around the planet. You need two wraps to get a decent magnitude. And so that's 40 minutes in. We have to issue in five. Our next message is in 30 minutes. So you're going to get two to three messages from us before we actually even have a clue that the magnitude's right. But we're usually within a couple tenths, so that's pretty good. Um, so this weekend, we put southern Alaska in warning as a precautionary measure. Thank you. are welcome. Okay. So for, wait, let's go up again. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So most of Alaska, I would have you for Cascadia, we would have you in an advisory, which means clear or close the harbor, clear the beach. And everybody else, all the residents, need to just stay home, stay off the roads, stay out of the way, stay home. Okay? Go ahead. Southeast in Canada, it's getting a little trickier. Yakutat is definitely at warning level. I probably wouldn't issue a warning for Yakutat alone, but I would call them on the phone and tell them that they needed to get a lot more serious about what to expect. And we would adjust that as we see water along the way. You know, and if it's, it's, if it's looking a little bigger than we're thinking, I would put them in a warning. Now we get down to Vancouver Island. Tofino is definitely warning level. So is Nia Bay, so is Port Angeles. I'm not too worried about uh, inside Puget Sound. I'm, they're, they're, they're in the earthquake. So they're, they should be evacuating. I mean, it's a nine. Seattle's going to be disseminated, de decimated without question. So they're, they're there. So go ahead, and there's the rest of the West Coast. So I would pretty much go from the north tip of Vancouver Island all the way down to Mexico and put them in warning. It's very, this is gonna be a really, really tough day. 
without question. So here's our levels. Anything above a meter is a warning. Basically, basically, no matter what, I want you to clear the beach and harbor, no matter what. And then if the water ends up being large enough, we'll start evacuating the town. But that's going to be called by your local emergency managers. That's going to be your fire department, your police chief, your harbor master, those folks. Dick. Dick. Absolutely bless his heart. Okay? You know, Herb, if you click on the warning box, I didn't check if that one would go. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry, the mouse. Oh, oh well. That's all right. Don't worry about it. So when Honshu happened, that's the red line crossing the ocean. These are our levels of warning. Orange is advisory. Warning is red. So we started in advisory, and then we upgraded to warning, and now we're downgrading to nothing as it crossed the planet. Okay. That's how you can get it. We also just got Twitter going. And we have Facebook going. And we have RSS going, and we have Google Alerts going. It's very exciting. I need to update my octopus. OK. All right. Does anybody want to take a stretch, take a break? We're doing OK? OK. Um, local tsunamis, these are the ones I can't warn you for. The warning center can't warn you for. This is our 20 seconds, right? OK. Um, and we have so many of these hazards right here. Let's go ahead and launch Iceberg. If the mouse will work. Oh, bless your heart. He's going to just go bail and use the regular one. Because we definitely have uh, glaciers calving here, do we not? Now, I think Cordova has changed. Say OK. Good enough? You want to make it big? What's interesting is we don't have any volume. That's all right. So this is Greenland. And basically, their iceberg is calving. Almost all tsunami videos have people in them. I don't know what's up with that. Someone has to take the photograph. I guess so. <laughs> I'd rather you be in a safe place before you take the video for me. But anyway, you can see that the wave is traveling across the inlet here, their fjord. But as it arrives, it's a problem. Yeah, it's a bummer. But it's that fast, right? No, it's just the cabin. I think the camera was shaking because of the quality of the film. Yeah. When was it? I think it was in the 90s, I believe. Can we see that again? People standing down there. You want to play it again, sir? Play it again, Sam? Oh, there's the volume. You could turn that up, and then we can hear the dude describing it. OK. It's to behave in a similar way. This is Greenland, August 1995. Perhaps a mile away from the harbor, an iceberg breaks apart. The falling ice sends out a wave which spreads rapidly across the fjord. The water is deep, and so like a tidal wave, the wave is long and low and barely visible. But when the wave reaches the shallow water of the harbor, it rises up.
imagine this multiplied a hundredfold. The scale, power, and danger of a true tidal wave can be awesome. Thank you. Go ahead and Big tidal shut her down. waves are rare. But yep. there were other types of wave. So the total time on that was a minute and a half. Af I mean, total time on the whole video. So it certainly <coughs> arrived in less than a minute. <coughs> That's exactly what we would expect in any deep water bay. You guys don't have a deep water bay, but I know you visit them. All right. Um, This landslide over here is an excellent example of what our fjords and landslides are like. When you, whenever we have a big event here, you guys are definitely going to be landsliding. There's no question about it. And so is absolutely all of southern Alaska. We have this sheer topography. We have these earthquake faults cutting the state up. Plus, we have tons of rain, right? So it saturates all the soils. So <coughs> that actually was taken in Chile, who's very much like us in southern Chile. They have fjords. Magnitude 6.5 dropped off that slab at the face of that rock there, and it ended up killing 10 people. Crossed their fjord in about 40 seconds. Okay, go ahead, Herb. Let's go to the next one. Uh, hit tsunamis around the world. These are the tele-tsunamis, the ones that cross the base, and Alaska's really good at making these. You want to go full screen? Thank you. All right, this is the Indian Ocean 2004. It's the first tsunami we re we've been able to witness and measure like this. And it was actually measured on every tide gauge on the planet. It, it took, this one probably went for the same amount of days. I wasn't there for that one. Um, but it took it over 30 hours to reach Alaska. And these magnitude nine events are large enough to be m to measurably alter our orbit on our axis. We can. I wonder. You can certainly see this from a satellite. It's interesting how much Australia sort of provides, like this buffer, or New Zealand sort of provides a buffer for the central southern Pacific basin. Absolutely, and by the time it reached the Pacific, it really was fairly negligible. I mean, we're just talking centimeters. But we did measure it, which is, I think, phenomenal. Because that's earthquake energy moving, right? OK, so we're uh, Go ahead and hit the, 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 the really pretty one in the middle under around the world. OK. This one's kind of tricky because you're going to have to bring it in off the screen. Oh, no, it <laughs> behaved itself. So this is the rupture under the water. No, you're good. The rupture under the water on the sea floor is pushing the water up. And this is showing also the difference between the depth. It'll restart here pretty soon. So the rupture under the water is pushing those pointy things up. That's water the energy is coming up. That's water coming up. The nature of, there you go. That's the rupture right there. And you can see that it's traveling much faster to Sri Lanka than it is to Thailand. And it's because the basin between Indonesia and Thailand is much shallower, so it's going much slower. And then it bounces off of Sri Lanka, and now it's coming back. So there's your reflection. That, those peaks, what do those represent actually? You know? it, well, it's because of the way the mapping is between the bathymetry below sea level compared to the topography above sea level, and the actual supercomputing isn't able to lay that water on the land. We're actually not able to overlay the ocean on the land, but we're working on it. And so basically, those are the peaks as it hits the shore, but what you need to do is translate those into going inland. And it's just they're artifacts of the model, and right now, with technology, that's, that's the best we can do. It'll come in, but it'll come in slowly. And it's just because of the tectonics here. If this happens offshore here, it's going to lift you up. I mean, in 64, it lifted you up about 8, 10 feet. There's clam beds that are above sea level now. And you can go Yakutaga, Yakutat here, and you can see terraces from 57, from the 40s, from the 30s, where it's been lifted up and up and up and up. So you're just in a regime that's rising. 
Middleton's amazing. I mean, ever? You use the word ever. <laughs> um, and really, the, the, tec the tectonic regime here is mountain building here. So it is growing, it is rising here. Um, but it's sinking in Cook Inlet. You know, when it rises here, it's dropping elsewhere. Could be, yeah. And, uh, but Girdwood definitely is. Palmer did. You know, so. Okay, go ahead. Let's go ahead and stop that one. Um, why don't you, let's launch, let's launch Valdez. Okay, the water's going to go out. Everybody needs to pick a building because we have to vertically evacuate before it gets in really fast. This is old Valdez. Okay, who lived? You've seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do it again? Yes. All right, go ahead. Oh, there you go. So that's one of nature's warning signs. What we've noticed in the last few really large events is when it goes out, it goes out really fast, fast enough to leave the fish flopping. And a lot of people go out to gather those fish. So yeah. the building, what are the, what's the, what's the height of a building, like 30, 40 feet? Yeah, I think so. <coughs> and the period between waves, so once it goes out, how long does it take it to come back in? It can be anywhere from 5 minutes to 20 minutes, just depending on the, how sh shallow or deep your bay is, the shape of your bay. Okay. Next slide. Yeah. Now, for the 64, uh, first rate, uh, in the but did loose friends in line? I would assume so. Okay. I mean, one thing about elephants is they have super sensitive feet. If there's something very, very sensitive about their feet. So, hundreds of miles away from each other, elephants can stomp, and other elephants will know it. No? Yeah. So they, they have a super sensitivity. So they felt the earthquake long before anybody else did. And the people riding those elephants got their lives saved, but they also thought the elephants were insane. It wasn't until later that they were grateful to be on their backs, absolutely, without a question. I always ask the kids, you know, are you going to get on your four-wheeler? They're like, no. I'm like, sure, why not? No, it can all terrain. Get on it. Don't get in a car. Like, are you going to ride your horse if you have one? Well, I'm like, your horse is long gone. You know, if you can catch it, but it's long gone. I know in the 7-9, my dog, who was paralyzed at the time, she had MS, so she was paralyzed from the mid-back down. She drug herself down three flights of stairs. And I'm like, what are you doing? Clunk, 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 because she wouldn't do that. She'd wait for me to carry her. Normally, she's a 70-pound German Shepherd. Drug herself down, hiding under the house. I followed her outside. like honey, because she would only otherwise that she would do that would be for a bear. Right? So it's like, what are you doing? We're fine. And then I started feeling it. But it was that much difference in time that she, she knew. It's interesting that those elves probably never experienced an earthquake of that capacity or that size that they knew. You know, humans have this default in our DNA, the, the rubber neck curiosity kind of gene pool thing. Yeah. Yeah, that we have to pause and go look and, and we have to just look. I think, it's, I think it's our lizard brain and the adrenaline or something we get from it, but animals, even insects know to veer if they're in danger, right? If they can, they won't hit whatever they're about to hit, but, you know, and they, they, they take off. They don't even think about looking at what the heck it is, right? Yeah. And so, anyway, yeah, we have a problem with that. We do. Um, there's a gal in Homer whose dog always climbs on her head every earthquake so she calls us and uh, and says well my dog's on my head again and I'm like why don't you wait five minutes and I'll tell you how big the earthquake is I mean the dog that dog is that accurate in Japan most people own catfish because their whiskers are sensitive so um, 
<laughs> I think it just probably, I, I doubt it flips over, but I mean, it probably swims kind of funky, gets nervous, you know. It's not the relaxed fish it usually is. I don't know. Um, Irv, you can click these in any order you want. Up. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, hopefully it'll work. Hmm. Wonder where it went. Don't know. Oh, we like Batman. Huh. Well, well. Just to escape. Escape! Run away! Oh, and way ahead, dude. Yep, please. Up, arrow. Up. They're going down, hun. Go up. Keep going. You're way ahead. I mean, you're super ahead. They're going to see the whole talk backwards. <laughs> Keep going. I mean, that's way ahead, huh? Oh, man. Yep. <laughs> Irv, you're at the bottom of the talk. Why aren't you using the mouse? <laughs> Let's not, don't use this. Use the real mouse. That's what I thought you were doing back here. Okay. That one works. Can you guys see that one? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, are you okay using the touch screen? Okay. <laughs> Do you want to try those other movies? The Or even the ones you tried? There. This is a local tsunami. It's modeled for Southeast Alaska. It could be anywhere in Alaska or anywhere there are islands. This is from a landslide, so you can see the tsunami. You can just let it wrap a little bit. It's not going to cross the Pacific, but it's definitely going to cause some problems right where it's at. And it's going to... No, that one is actually Prince of Wales Island. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's try the other one. The one next to it, yeah. Left click. Left click. There. Oh. Yo! Just click it. Sorry, gang. Sorry, gang. It happens. I don't know why it's working for me. This button. Yeah. Okay. So this is a distant tsunami arriving in the same region. So yeah, it's getting protected by those outside islands, but then again, it's not. And one of the things we've learned in the last uh, several years, should we try to click on that one again? Maybe. There you go. Is, is island wraparound. By the nature of a wave, when it's, riving, when it's wrapping around the island, on the backside, it may actually nullify itself to nothing, or it may double or triple in height yeah. when the waves meet each other. So this island wraparound is actually a real problem. And then it's bouncing off of other islands. Correct. But in our case, right. As soon as you get shallow, that's a whole nother okay. Idaho. Absolutely. Far left black box. We'll give it a shot. Yep. Gosh. Technology is so fun. When it, works. when it works. Oh, God, we really want Batman. Yeah, uh huh. Sure, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can talk from here and you can point at stuff. 
It doesn't want to go, does it? Uh, thank you. You're welcome. It's not you. Nope. Let's go back up. See if me. any of these others. It's not you. It's me. No, none of them want to go. You just never know. Okay, we're going to look at Batman. So it's this one and then that one. Um, the reason I have Batman on here is because if you ever drive down from Thompson Pass down into Valdez, have you guys noticed those mountain blades? It's just like... So what's happening there, which is exactly what's happening here on the other side of those blades, is the rock is getting pushed up and thrust up. And that's what's building those mountains. This is actually the fastest growing, the Chugach St. Elias are the fastest growing mountain range on the planet right now. Anywhere from 10 to 20 centimeters a year. Pretty soon St. Elias itself, which as far as I'm concerned is way taller than Denali, and it starts at sea level, right? I mean, Denali starts at like 1,000 feet. And it's only about 100 feet difference at the summit. Yeah. So pretty soon, it's going to be the tallest mountain on the continent. Okay, go ahead. It's geological. <laughs> so if you... 20 centimeters a year. And it's faster than the Himalayan mountain. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It sure is. Although it's a tight race. You want to hit that baby again? So when an earthquake ruptures... You know, on the news you see a dot, but the truth is, is that it's a rupture over a large piece of space. In 1964, it ruptured from Yakutat to Kodiak. It's a long distance. Go ahead and add water in the lower corner. What was that last picture out of It's actually Indonesia, but it could be any of our trenches. Want to do it again? Would it literally be that fast? Yeah. I mean, that mm -hmm. Yes, it would be. The first way the P wave travels about the speed of sound. So it's, it's pretty fast. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Or <laughs> we'll watch it again. That's okay. <laughs> it's all good. Let's do it backwards. We did the talk backwards, so. Okay, down arrow. All right, so the nature of these great big events, these mega thrust tsunamis, is basically we've got the ocean plate subducting, right, under our continent, and the continent gets stuck stuck, 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 stuck until the rock just can't bend anymore and then it releases, right? So that's what raises Cordova, Montague Island, is this outside edge that raises up. And then of course this side drops down just like a seesaw. So this would be Girdwood, Seward. Go ahead. Here's Montague Island. It was raised 11 meters or 33 feet. So the old shoreline is right here. Okay. Of course, there's Girdwood and the ghost trees. I'm pretty sure you guys have all seen that. And if this is not from a tsunami. This is because the land sunk, and so the salt water, you know, moved inland and suffocated the trees. Okay. So the nature of it is the ground underneath, the ocean floor underneath. If Hercules is sitting down there on the ocean floor and picking up the earth underneath, that pushes the water up. That's all a tsunami is, is the entire water column is disturbed. Okay. Here it is again. And then you can just click through these slowly. Okay. You said before that um, Wait. we can tell where uh, if the ground is being pulled down or being pushed up at that fault. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's the whole column and then of course it's moving. It's a gravity wave at this point. So it's going to be moving outwards. And if we compare it to a hurricane, there is Hurricane Sandy. OK, Hurricane Sandy and all the other hurricanes are viable disasters. Um, but they only disturb about the top 100 to 300 feet of water. And in a tsunami, it's the whole water column. So that's the difference. Let's hope this guy plays. Go ahead and just click in the middle. I hope he plays. 
It's playing, yay. This is a surprise for you, Irv. You can come out if you want. Long before the tsunami hit the tourist beaches, it was threatening lives at sea. Off the Thai coast, Dutch dive boat operator Frank van der Linde was underwater with 13 other divers, some of them disabled. When we left on our business trip, we had on the boat three Dutch people. We had one person in the wheelchair and the rest of the divers were actually all experienced divers. As they slipped beneath the waves, there was no sign they were about to dive into the heart of the tsunami. Until... The fish actually did start to act up a bit differently. They were racing around the dive site. I thought this is a bit weird, a bit strange. And I was taking a shot of a, a clownfish in an anemone. Um, as usual, the anemones are just moving gently with like with the uh, surge, and then suddenly they just went over flat like that. And that's pretty much where it started. And we got down about 22 the meters, then uh, the current started really pick up. It just came out of nowhere, it went really dark and we were getting pushed against the rocks. The corals and rocks started suddenly flow around. Even fishes started to bump into them. There's a big cloud of dust coming towards us, so the visibility dropped from maybe 30 meters to about 30 centimeters. And I uh, decided to get all my guys close to the bottom to hold on to some rocks and suddenly even these rocks sort of lift up the bottom and flow over our head and all of a sudden it was like if, if we were being in a washing machine the current took us up in less than five seconds from 17 meters up to two meters and then it took That's us down dangerous. again i grabbed the hand of the of one of the girls one of the dead girls and we were actually lifted up by the current I lost the rest of the group. I passed by the other deaf girl, grabbed her hand as well. We passed by the boy line. So what we did was we were holding onto the line. And that's where we stayed for two, three minutes to make safety stop. And then on the line, we actually went up to the surface. Now, Frank feared for the lives of the other divers. I was looking around and I couldn't find anyone. That's where I actually started to panic where are the other guys one girl came up another person came up but the disabled diver was still underwater and visibility was almost zero no one knew where he was so we were looking at the surface for the bubbles and after maybe two three minutes that was uh, adrian the cameraman and uh, naomi this is the deaf instructor who works in the boat as well they had yours with them so they actually were holding on to yours and throw them up to the surface. We've been actually very, very lucky. I'd say. The best place to be when a tsunami hits is to be in the water. And the best place to be is actually to be in deep water. It could have been way, way worse. Cool footage. So how deep, how deep was it? Well, but more than 70, right? Because he said they were at about 70 in depth and then it pushed them up to the surface. I'm, I was thinking 70 feet, personally, but I'm, you know, I'm not certain. Okay, that's pretty deep, diving like a scuba Yeah, that's beyond recreational. Yeah, 120 feet for short times. And of course they had a coral reef, so, yeah. you know, it does make sense, but. Even still, yeah, I mean, I think it's great footage. Shall we continue? Good job. <laughs> so out in the deep water, we know how fast they go. We can predict their speed. We can, we can actually predict their travel time for the most part within about 10 minutes. And we can almost predict how, how big it's going to be. Um, we could not do that last Saturday. Uh, until we actually got some water to measure it against. And we did have, I mean, we definitely had a tsunami. It was measured in Alaska, Canada, Washington, California, Oregon, and Hawaii. Um, nobody got hurt, so that's good. Okay. When it comes up in a normal shallow area that is not as shallow as Cordova, just, in, just a normal regime, it'll slow down to about 30. 
in Honshu, we learned that it was more like 50. Um, it's about as fast as a bear. It's still a lot faster than me, right? And I have no idea if we're going to be able to get the next movie to play. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try, because it's here on the fist, right? Maybe it'll work. Maybe. I'm just going to go back up here. OK. Can you guys hear me OK? All right. Okay, 1020, the tsunami is right here. Can you see the mouse all right? No. All right. These folks don't have a clue what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Except for they didn't turn the camera off, bless their hearts. For two minutes, I hope that I saw the boat on here. 1025, the water's gone out. The boats are dry. Det så försvann allt vatten och nu så står alla båtar som ni ser här helt stansatta och vi kommer inte komma iväg om vi inte tar en av de få båtar som vi lyckas putta ner. Och de säger att de aldrig haft det här problemet tidigare att vatten försvann ungefär 20 meter ner på 2-3 minuter. Så nu ska vi försöka ta och hitta en annan båt här och Sara hon ser glad ut ändå. Ja. Så hon hittade en skäl. Det är värt att ta. Men de som är bakom är lite orolig. So they're actually leaving. Men eh, mot, vad heter den? Stannen? Puttra med eller sådär. På för 20 sekunder så kommer den ungefär... She's standing in the tsunami. That's actually it right there. 4 meter vatten. 10.29. And the peak of it is right here. Det är ett jävla sjukt. Vi har liksom knappt oss upp på stranden innan jag...
Ich bin schon weg, halt. So that was three minutes. I mean, in Alaska, we're still shaken, right? That was just three minutes' time. That's something. That's a lot of water in three minutes. Yeah. All right, Swerve, sort of, I think we're through most of the movies. What do you think? No, I think you're awesome. I really appreciate it. If you don't mind, do you mind? All right, so let's click through this. These are the faults of Alaska, these red lines here. These are your veins. We have a lot of activity here. Yes, we do. Okay, go ahead. When the Pacific Plate is diving under Alaska, just click through slow. We get earthquakes on its way down, of course. And then as the ocean plate is kissing the mantle, that's what frees up the magma to make the volcanoes. The distance between the volcanoes and the trench. There's the trench. So that's the entire surface area that's affected by the subduction of our trench. That goes all the way up to Fairbanks. That's a lot of land, okay? Notice you guys are kind of on that center line coming down the middle. You guys are right in the transition zone. Keep going. On the, over on the side in the southeast, we've got the strike slip regime, which is side by side. More earthquakes there. Those are usually in the sevens and eights. And then there's the Yakutat block that is currently accreting, which is causing the Chugash and the St. Elias to rise as fast and quickly as it is. It's being pushed right in. And up and around it goes, causing earthquakes like the 2002 event. It's, right it's accreting, it's pushing on. Yep. So these are all the earthquakes that we're aware of in Alaska since 1900. It's a lot of earthquakes. Uh, red, orange ones are shallow, the, the blue ones are deep. So what the deep ones tell me is the angle of subduction. So if we're looking under Cook Inlet, it's pretty shallow, right? to go all the way back to uh, Fairbanks. And as we get out into the trench, it gets steeper. It's not that we don't have deep quakes, it's that the trench is nearly vertical. Okay? We have a lot more earthquakes in California. A whole lot more. Mm -hmm. They've got a lot more damage than we do. They got a lot more infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. They don't build with nearly as much wood as we do. They don't have as many log cabins as we do. Wood does incredibly well. It's amazing. But also, most of our earthquakes are vertical in nature. Theirs are horizontal and shallow. So that knocks down a lot more buildings. Oh, we have one more movie, don't we? OK. So um, we tried to figure out a way to come up, to, come up with uh, those of us that did not grow up in the Cold War which is most of us in this room, right? But even still, 
the kids nowadays really don't know what a bomb means. You know, some of them have seen some of the video, but really they can't relate to it like we can. And so we're trying to come up with another way to handle it. And really the best way, go ahead and click, is um, the one I like the best anyway is this world energy calculation. So based on the consumption that we're using right now, today's levels, including oil and gas and hydro and solar and coal and everything, a magnitude 9 would power our planet for 90 years. Huge amount of energy. Go ahead and click. Our earthquake, the 9.2, would power the planet for almost 180 years. So that's the energy that's moving through the ocean basin. So the Trade Center collapse, what's that analogy? Well, I was trying to figure out something that kids would relate to. And so it's how many buildings. Yeah. Can you wrap your head around that? Does that make sense? Not really. Not to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so once we did the math, I'm like, but the energy works. Yeah. It definitely. And the bombs, the bombs kind of work. I mean, two million bombs, I don't know. It's a, once you get one, I mean, one was enough, right? So two million is plenty. Think there's any way you can hit that corner? Nope. <laughs> You know, it's a logarithmic scale. However, it's actually, as far as energy goes, it's 32 times more energy per tenth. Um, but as far as ground shaking goes, it's 10 to 14 times more per tenth. So it depends on how you use that number. We, keep, we have Virginia in here because it freaked a lot of people out on the East Coast to have a 5.8, right? Yeah. Um, and then including 1994's California quake, every single one of these except Virginia has caused a tsunami. And <coughs> other than the California quake and Loma Prieta, all of these have been since 2000. So there's a 7.7. Seven. Should be guessing. What's the next ring? <laughs> eight one, eight two. Good guess. It is similar to that. I love scale. Don't you love scale? That's actually the name of this movie. It's perspective. Eight eight. Give me an eight seven. There's your 8-8. Eight, eight. There's last year's. There's 9-1. Well, come on, there's ours. And then the granddaddy of them all. I don't know what happened to Virginia, but it's long gone. Yeah. Yeah. My friend Nate uh, keeps this animation up to date. So every time there's a big event, he'll, he tosses it on there. So I'm pretty That's sure great. I'll see his 7-7 seven, seven from this weekend, probably on Monday, right? So when we look at Alaska's tectonics, these big blobs here are areas that broke during certain earthquake times. So that one there is 1964, 1938, 46, okay? We have some gaps. There's a Shimigan gap right there. So that makes us nervous. That could support something in the AIDS. That's the most important one right there. That's a Yakutat block. It's a seismic. Okay. Here's our gaps, my bouncing stars. So when you say there are gaps, so they haven't had a earthquake, so we're expecting one there. Yep. Welcome to your neighborhood. <laughs> So here's your neighborhood again. And this is kind of some of the dynamics about it with how the blocks are working. So the Yakutat block is actually accreting to Alaska at about four and a half centimeters a year. But the rest of the plate is subducting five to 10 centimeters a year, depending on where you are on the plate. Geologically speaking, when you're talking one or two centimeters and after moving, then when you look at 20 centimeters, it's probably going to have a lot sooner than 
<laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, geologically speaking. I think we can jump to that conclusion because geologists love to arm wave and absolutely it's perfect. Yeah. Um, this just gives you a feel for how it's moving, right? So we're, we're creating into the northwest, the wrangle block is moving west, and then we've got the Seldovia arch that's actually moving kind of southwest, and then we've got the trench where everything's moving northwest. It's actually very complex. It's, kind of a it's totally a mess, but that's part of why it's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful because it's a mess. Mm -hmm. Okay. We call these beach balls, and basically they just tell us which way the Earth is moving, but these are the major quakes that have happened about since, uh, I'd say probably since 1940. Okay? This is a tsunami history. Okay? So if I were to place a magnitude Oh, I think Bill Bill made this for me, and I think it's an 8.4, 8.2 or an 8.4, which is about what the Yakutat block would support, is something in the mid-8s. So if we're going to put the epicenter right there, this travel time map is not ours. This is 10-minute increments. So we're looking at 10, 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes maybe. It's not two minutes but it's still pretty fast. Here's the model, the energy model for that earthquake. And this is how it shows up on our static model. It's hard to read those, but where you see the first one that goes over a meter, that's Cape Hitchinbrook. Okay. And Cordova's up to a meter, so we would definitely see some water here, but luckily it would come in slowly. And then down to uh, Cape Fairweather, that's also a meter. Now, the rest of Alaska looks to me like it's still going to be in an advisory level. Actually, all the way down the west coast into Washington, it's going to be in an advisory level event. So basically, what do I want you to do? I want you to clear the harbor and get off the beach, listen to Dick, and stay home if you can. Most likely, I do not expect Cordova would need to evacuate, but I do expect Yakutat would. Right? OK. Here's further on down. Now, this is a similar fault of equal magnitude, but it's over on the fair weather. So the first one was right on the Yakutat block where we're actually accreting, right? This is over in the strike slip regime. So that's the difference in energy between an earthquake that's moving vertically in a thrust environment where it's squishing onto the land versus side by side. Much smaller event still might, you know, give us, give us a problem. Okay, knocks you down, it's a nine. Okay, 20 seconds is a seven. Okay. Everybody got it? All right, keep going, if it will. Uh, just skips right through that one, that's my little. Okay, <laughs> one more, okay stop. This is the only tsunami you're allowed to surf. It's the only one that is, uh, you'd actually have to get permission to surf, but just, this is the Oregon Research Lab. 